Hello friends, I am Dr. Bharat Modi from Wellcare Hospital Varodhra. I have spent what I would think is an almost an entire lifetime uh, working in the area of total knee arthroplasty and arthroplasty at large, but certainly much more focused on the total knee arthroplasty. And on request of my fellows and students, I have decided to come up with a series of lectures which will take you through what I would consider as a as a primer and as an overview of understanding the science and art of arthroplasty. Friends, if you have any inclination to go into further personalized discussions on this matter, you are most welcome to approach us at Wellcare Hospital. We will be exhibiting the contact information for that. And for any uh, questions that you might have, it will be my pleasure to help you understand and navigate your pathway in this area of work. Today is the second lecture. The first lecture was on the history of the evolution of knee implants and how fascinating, brilliant figures played their role in bringing us the science that we take it as everyday fact today. And today it's going to be about how to select an implant or at least it's an understanding that you get as to how complex an act it actually is when you decide on how to select an implant for your practice. So let's move on. After that qualification, jump into a six month fellowship, learn the manual muscle memory technique of how to put a component team. So, uh, if, if at all the young surgeons end up having their muscle memory about uh, putting in an implant without understanding why they are putting a particular implant, what implant are they putting in, how can this be better than the other or worse than a similar one. So you need to understand how to select your implants or at least if nothing else, why have you selected the implant? What are the features of this implant that you are going to put in? So next, as I say, the history of arthroplasty is not something new. As far back as Egyptian times, <laughs> people had started thinking about doing something on, on, to, on the knee. And then of course, the remark theory that in the late, towards the closing, the closure of 19th century, this doctor, Mr. Chris Gluck had created this ivory implant of a remarkable accuracy and uh, features that we see in the modern day knee implants. Next, please. And then from there, we jump straight to the 20th century, in the early mid part of 20th century, where relatively modern uh, science, uh, you know, engineering sciences started creeping into uh, medical sciences. And Smith Peterson uh, came up with a simple concept of mold, just resurfacing the lower end of the femur. Next. And then from there, we ended up doing an actual implant, which means connecting the two sides together. And this was the famous Waldia snake, you know, and uh, they, they, this were, were put in, in their thousands actually. Although later on the Waldia snake was withdrawn because of a very high failure rate. Because while it, while it looks a solid and heavy engineering, uh, uh, engineered piece of metal, the fact of the matter is that it was creating too much of loosening and therefore it was creating too much of uh, destruction, bone destruction. And then people started realizing that maybe just putting a surface on might not be enough. So the, the Smith Peterson mold out of plastic started getting an extension rod, as you can see here. However, Right up to from Egyptian times to the 1890s, the times of Themistocles Gluck, and from then onwards, the Smith Peterson mold arthroplasties or the Townley tibial arthroplasty plate, or in the late 20th century or mid to late 20th century, the age of the Waldius hinge knee, all these were uh, essentially the preparatory stage. The real takeoff of the science of arthroplasty started when, in the very early 1970s, Peter Walker joined forces with Chit Ranaud and Insol. Before this period, there were a couple of other remarkable work done by a surgeon called Michael Freeman from England, and these were in the late 60s, where he came up with incredibly evolved understanding. And while Michael Freeman was doing his work on the knee side, that legendary name called John Charney in the same period was doing his work on the hip side. Both of these were English surgeons, 
working in Yemen. Today we are focusing on the neon to classified and therefore the history of which I am leaving aside. Right. So, building on the works of Michael Freeman, in 1971, Peter Walker, a biomedical engineer, when he joined forces with John Insel and Chit Rama at the Hospital for Special Surgery, and here started the real march of the modern day arthroplasty joint. And it started uh, Phil Wilson, the head of uh, uh, Hospital for Special Surgery, told two of his protagonists. He told Chit Rana to pursue the anatomic line of thought and he told John Insult to pursue the functional line of thought. The, the anatomic line of thought basically meant that uh, you try to preserve the posterior cushions. In the very early phases, the anatomic line of thought attempted to preserve both cushions, anterior and posterior. Yeah. Later on, it was realized that perhaps trying to save anterior cushion was a non stunt so later on it graduated down to the anatomic line of thought trying to preserve the posterior cushion. Whereas the functional line of thought was about sacrificing both cushions, not to be rigid about trying to maintain the normal anatomy of the human knee. Instead, try to improve the function of the human knee rather than trying to preserve the normal anatomy of the human knee as part of the act of arthroplasty. So next please. As you can see here, the very early 1973. It is they almost look like you, the two unique condylars just joined together with a strip of metal. So these are known as duo condylars. Again, this is Ranawat's uh, moving forward with the anatomic concept, you know. And there were other concepts of the same thing preceding Ranawat. In the late 50s, early uh, sorry, through the 60s, things such as the Dunstan knee, they were also similar type of concepts of unique condylar like a small strip of toad metal sitting on the femoral condyle and a grooved ray like sitting on the tibia. So these were the Gunston knees, uh, unicornials, and similar McKeever, Gunston. These are names, but that's more about history, so I'm now skipping forward. So here, next, please. And then it, it started improving. People realized that you cannot ignore the patellofemoral joint. Initially, it was all about just focusing on the femoral tibial joint. And therefore, you saw two unicondylars joined with a strip of metal. Later on, Ranavar uh, and the group, they realized that we need to take patellofemoral joint as part of this replacement philosophy. And therefore, you see that the first of the flange, patelloflange, starts coming into uh, picture. As I told you, Freeman was contributing, already had started contributing from the, during the 60s, right up to the early 70s. Michael Freeman. Swanson was the Biomedical engineers were joining. So remember, the one thing that you need to remember about all these science is that there are parallel processes. It's not sequential. There are parallel processes and they overlap each other and cross pollinate each other. So next please. So now, the important landmark or milestone in the journey of the evolution of uh, knee designs, uh, arthroplasty implant designs, is when the Overall, the community of arthroplasty surgeons who were at the forefront of the research came to a conclusion that we need to replace the surfaces of all three compartments medial, femorotibial, lateral femorotibial, and the patellofemoral. And as that happened, one day while having lunch in the uh, cafeteria of uh, the Hospital for Special Surgery, Chief Rana just mentioned over lunch to Peter Walker, why don't we label this total condylar? Because we have replacing all the contacts and that's how the term stuck and from then onwards all the implants that you guys have ever seen let us I put they are all referred generally as total condylar knees you know? so as I said the first design was duo condylar where the patella femoral uh, joint was not taken into consider and this evolved into the total condylar next please and uh, before the word total condylar was brought into play, it was known as duo patella. This is again Keith Ranavar's uh, uh, evolution, where in John Insol and Chitranjan Ranavar, they, both those approaches, they came together, both realizing that you cannot strictly be an anatomical follower and at the same time you cannot strictly be just a functional thing, you know. So they started converging and therefore now you can see that this is the world's first non-hinge 
Remember, boldiest hinge had already come, and before that, if you want to call glutes knee as part of the arthroplasty range of implants, then in 1895. But the world's first non hinge tri compartment hinge. The, the, the Duo Patella, the McKeevers, the uh, Gunstons, they are all there, but they were not they were not tri compartmental addressing these, you know. And at this point, it was as I told you a compromise between the functional and anatomy. <laughs> so the posterior cruciate was still retained, although the anterior cruciate had already been uh, uh, in a circuit as spina. Next week. And then they started realizing at, in New York that the HSS, the Insol Ranawat team, started realizing that trying to retain the posterior cruciate in the actual surgical action when it was happening was quite a challenging task. They inevitably had to do something or the other to the PCL, and if they did not do it, it left the PCL too tight in so many cases. And when it was too tight, obviously there was a restriction of flexion movement, etc. And so they took a combined decision: let's remove the PCL as well. And there you see the first signs when they started removing. You, you see the first dent that started coming up here. Which is the beginning of the box and spine mechanism, the spine cap mechanism, and this little bump that you see here, you know, and that also in a way provided medial lateral stability, which was lacking in the previous generations, including Michael Freeman's knee, of uh, Freeman Samuelson and Freeman Swanson knees, which Michael Freeman later acknowledged that I, I, it was my mistake not to have brought in some feature to control the medial lateral slide, you know. Next, please. And in 1976, so in the first five years of 70s, from 70 to 75, 76, 80 percent of the thought process is crystallized as far as knee designs are concerned. And HSS abundance the abundance the retention of the posterior cruciate. Boston. In the meantime, the same team, Keith Ranawat's team, had gone to Boston as part of their academic exchanges. And in Boston, there is a very famous hospital called uh, Robert Brigham and Women's Children uh, Hospital, uh, Brigham Women's and Children Hospital. And uh, here, uh, uh, Bill Harris, one of the legendary figures in uh, in orthopedics at large, he and his team were there, and they looked and they got caught on by this science as had been presented to them at that point in time, which was about retaining the posterior cruciate ligament, and they saw a tremendous merit in it. So even though the row genitals in the form of Ranavat and Insol, even though they abandoned, by this time the Bill Harris team in Boston had already taken up further evolution of, of the designs and they said no, we should retain the uh, posterior cruciate. And therefore Boston adopts the duo patella implant which advocates the retention, whereas the, the progenitor of duo patella at HSS, they abandoned it in favor of a next layer uh, type of design in which the posterior cruciate was sacrificed. The great debate is gone and still continues today. Should we or should we not retain the posterior cruciate? Next please. So two distinct knee implant designs and surgical philosophies emerged. And now, if you have understood this up to now, this is where your actual core of today's lecture is, as far as selection of implants is concerned, and then onwards. But it had to be put into perspective how you reached this the great debate whether to retain the PCL or not to retain the PCL. So in New York, PCL excision was there, they took that as a philosophy. In Boston, PCL retention is what they took as their philosophy. Next, please. From so now we are quickly going to how implant designs evolved, okay, in the way in which you see them today. So from 76 onwards up to now, in case you have noticed all those other historical photographs, almost every patella, that, uh, sorry, the tibial component that you see was an all poly tibial. There was no metal tray, if you have seen in the uh, earlier system. The modularity in the form of the metal tray with a removable plastic insert and exchangeable plastic insert. That idea was brought into play by surgeons known as Iftekar and David Murray. Iftekar, again, these are names that you will, you would never have heard 
in this generation of surgeons, unless you go into the history textbooks, and probably you will never hear of them. But the easiest, the most likable feature that a young surgeon has, which means the ability to change that insert right up till the last moment so that you can balance the need to your satisfaction. That was not brought by the big names like Michael Freeman, John Inser, or Chitranam. They were brought in by equally intellectual giants, uh, but their name was Dr. Iftikhar and Dr. David Murray, both of them working in the US. Iftikhar brought uh, a system of modularity, but in his case, after trial, before inserting the final implant, you had to fix the plastic insert solidly with the metal tray and then use it like a model. Whereas David Murray changed it to the point where he actually allowed the implantation of the metal tray with cement and then you could put in the final plastic insert, the way in which you do it these days. Yeah. So why did metal back tibia appear? They developed in response to high failure rate associated with associated with all political parts. Although I would change it, although it's my own lecture, I think I would change it to say high failure rate associated with one particular type of uh, all poly tibial insert and that was a tibial insert called UCLA Irving, University of California, Los Angeles, Irving is the campus. They had come up with a particular type where the all poly tibia was only 4 mm thick and it was later realized <laughs> that 4 mm thick plastic is too thin it will under under pressure it will do a little bit of flexural uh, changes and that will break the cement mantle down and that will lead to early loosening so two things happen in response to this if the car uh, or actually burst in uh, that's another person anyway he came up with the idea based on he was a biomedical engineer and he said why don't you apply a layer of stiff material underneath this four millimeter plastic what is stiff material Metal. So he suggested that if you put a metal tray underneath this plastic, then it will gain the stiffness that you are uh, required in a knee replacement situation. Hmm? So that's how that metal tray came. And that's how if the car and David Murray took the advantage of the, the introduction of a metal tray and came up with the idea, then why don't we provide modularity so that you can adjust the thickness of your insert right up to the last point. Hmm? So that's how it came into existence. Most companies use cobalt chrome trays. Sinto introduced a titanium black back uh, uh, tibial plug. So today your metal trays are broadly classified into either a titanium back metal tray or a cobalt chrome. Because we are at the selection of implants level, I remind me if I forget it later on. Why am I mentioning something as mm, detailed as whether a metal tray is made of cobalt chrome or a titanium as a metal material? We'll touch upon this in a few slides down this uh, down the road. Yeah? Sinto is the name of a company at that point in time, and it played a very important role in the evolution of the cobalt. Next, please. So fixed bearing. So now you have these many types of design. Uh, in the world, which wherein you can sort of broadly classify them or lump them in plants into any one of these. You know? So you have the fixed bearing posterior cruciate retaining, you have the fixed bearing modular posterior cruciate substituting, these are the two most common standard implants. Fixed bearing, but with modularity. Then you have the fixed bearing without modularity. So monoblock. Once again, it could be retaining or substituting. So, it's not a singular cascade like this. You need to understand that when we talk about selection of implants, you come to total modular, and then some of the other subdivisions are not natural linear cascades, yeah. but they are certain yeah. features, yes, parallel features. Yeah. So, you have the mobile bearing. What is the difference between fixed bearing and mobile bearing? Very good. So, you will keep this in mind mm -hmm. and you will come across this what it means as I go through each one of these. Okay. And then you have the ceramic component prosthesis, which is lumped as a separate prosthetic. It's not so much about the design as about the material, but it is so dramatically different that I have put it as a separate 
implant system altogether and therefore I am putting it as one of the options in your selection of implants. You know? And lastly you have the medial pivot knee design where it is the opposite. It is not the material which is different in any way, it is the design which is dramatically different. You know? So if you talk purely in terms of design, then it is this fixed pairing, mobile pairing and medial pivot. This would be the real, uh, you know, sort of only on design basis. But on material basis, you could have this or including the titanium, you know. And then you have certain other features these days, the coatings on the things. So there are many nuances to the material, and we can talk about it later. Hmm? Do mobile very possibly also have a retake in shape, retaining subsequent age? Oh yes. In fact, in the there are some companies which provide that option within the mobile bearing range as well. Because the logic of bringing mobile bearing instead of a fixed bearing is completely different. It has nothing to do with whether a PCL is retained or not. And that again you will see. Next please. So, once again, if you talk about primary TKR, you have total quantity and you have unique quantity. We are not even going to touch this because this lecture is all about total quantity. Next. Amongst the total quantity, you have the fixed bearing, you have the mobile bearing. As I told you, that based, and I have not kept the uh, medial pivot here. Mm. So these are the standard, uh, you know, vast majority of water. So you have the fixed bearing and you have the mobile, mobile bearing. Next please. Amongst the fixed bearing, you have the modular, you have the monoblock. That simple thing about whether TBI is modular or not. Within this, you have the PCL sacrificing and saving, sacrificing and saving. So the, this particular cascade gives you the options that perhaps 98% of surgeons across the world end up using an implant from this table up to now. Next please. So let's have quickly look at the features of what, what is retaining of PCL retaining type design all about. What is PCL sacrificing design type all about? You know. So as late as 1995. 85% of all TKA performed in the USA were using retaining processes in the you know, right, uh, right up to the middle of 90s. Next please. In the, and why? Why was PCA retained? Why is the Boston group uh, so enamored by retaining the PCA? And why today's surgeons who retain PCA, they will, they will argue for it based on this part of the theories, you know, that in the healthy knee, the PCL improves the quadriceps liver arm and age similar to roll back. And therefore, if you retain it, those gains are still retained by the replaced knees. Hmm? Those uh, knees are, so in the healthy knee, the PCL improves the quadriceps liver arm and age similar to roll back <coughs> in the healthy knee. And uh, so those who subscribe to the PCL retaining uh, philosophy, they still believe that this does. But those who have abandoned, they say that these actions, it's controversial whether the PCL is able to improve on the femoral rollback. In fact, later on as science improved and you started having uh, image intensifiers where dynamic images could be captured. There are very clear cut uh, papers which show that in fact, in a cruciate retained knee where you don't have the spine and the cam mechanism to guide the femur as it rolls back, in a cruciate retained knee, as it is here, this is a cruciate retained knee, incidentally this model that is lying here, in, instead of a femoral roll back, a paradoxical anterior slide occurs. Instead of a femoral roll back, as the knee goes into flexion, the femoral condyles they slide forwards. So it is because the two sheets are meant to work together. So without the ACL. Yes. So later on, those who observe that, they said it is common sense that a PCL, if you expect a PCL to work after you having exercised the ACL, and any sports surgeon who reads a MRI or the radiologist who reads the MRI. We will put the buckling of a PCL as one of the confirmatory signs of an ACL being absent in that knee or at least incompetent mm -hmm. in that knee. You know? And what does the buckling of that ligament indicate? It means it has lost its tension. Once a ligament loses its tension, it stops doing the work that it was supposed to do. 
So it is plain logic. But many times we scientists, if we think or arrogate ourselves as scientists, are actually highly opinionated uh, orders of uh, members of different religious orders. But in this case, the religious order being PCL retainers or PCL sacrifices. So uh, just a firm thing, but in my hands it has worked well, is good enough science to say that the PCL is contributing in my group of patients. You know? So in the healthy next place. So these were the retaining retainers, they put forth these arguments as the reason why PCL should be retained. Increased AP stability, they say, improved proprioception, you know, improved femoral rollback, which I just showed you there is adequate uh, data to show. Increased various valgus stability. Actually, in a revision knee, when you don't have a competent LCL, you will actually migrate towards a spine cam mechanism of an even increased nature in, the, in its dimensions and columns to give you stability. But anyway, they felt that it increased their various circuit stability. Although I must admit that uh, uh, intact collector ligaments, if you have done your stuffing right and tense them out properly in your totally anthroposity, yes, those MCL and LCL will give you various circuit stability. A uh, posterior cruciate contributes, and this again what surprises me, how can scientists ignore facts that are well documented? In any anatomy, any chapter of knee, uh, if you look in the first few chapters, like the anatomy and the biomechanics of the knee, it will be brought out that a PCL adds to various valgus stability only in full extension. It does not add to various valgus stability later on, once you start flexing. It's your collaterals which are the primary and the entire posterior capsule in full extension can once again uh, give you a, a various valgus stability. But the moment you flex it and the posterior capsule becomes uh, lax, now it's only your collaterals which contribute. But some of the retainers felt that it adds and that it increases the quadriceps force. And yes, it saves bone. You now this I would not contest. And it saves that little bone. And in the early designs, that intercondylar amount of bone that was being taken out was quite massive. In response to that criticism, the later day designs have reduced the bone loss to such a small sliver of bone that I don't think now this even holds water. Next, please. Fixed query. So, however, this type of prosthesis, despite all those arguments in its favor, this type of prosthesis fell out of favor to some extent for reasons such as. Early device, I told you that um, uh, the early devices had uh, uh, problems. They were very thin uh, tibial bodies. And if your PCL becomes tight mm -hmm. in flexion, it will generate pressure on the poly. And so they started failing. The, the PCL retaining implants showed a higher rate of mm -hmm. plastic uh, wear and plastic breakage. You know? Some of the theoretical advantage which we discussed just now were not seen in actual clinical settings. Right? And it was difficult to balance PCL, especially in advanced deformities or even in not advanced deformities. And there's a different mm -hmm. Uh, lecture that I have in which I am debating the PCL retaining versus sacrificing and we will talk about it when we reach that. Next week. However, there are many leading centers who have improved on the design features over the years and many recent studies indicate excellent results which are, which are comparable to the PCL substitute. So in all due fairness, it's not as if the PCL retainers are complete bonkers, you know. They have come up with adequate centers have come up with adequate number of uh, patients having been given this implant, and those patients have not had any lesser results than the other group. And therefore, this debate continues because an out and out disaster who would be right, you know. So next please. However, having said all that, the substituting design since 1995 onwards, the trend has changed, and in 2001. Uh, so why is in 2001, 46% of TKS performed were PCL substituting? Next please. So that's a mistake there. Huh? Uh, so yeah, yeah, go back, but in fact, I have to change. I think something has, uh, you know. Now, the point is that out and out, more number of substituting knees are being put 
as compared to Britain. So ECS sacrificing needs are far more in number. From 95 onwards, the, the, the trend started changing. And I'll give you an understanding of why that trend started changing. Next, please. The reasons for this change in the trend were that people started noticing that the PCL was very degenerate in many cases. So why retain them? You cannot just retain something which your common sense says is degenerate. Proper tensioning of PCL is surgically demanding and in fact, in my opinion, almost it's a theoretical impossi impossibility. But I will not expand on it just now. We will talk about it when we reach that particular lecture. PCL function in aiding the femoral roll back is extremely unpredictable. I told you there is so many there are so many documented cases where there is actually a paradoxical anterior slide, let us have a posterior road map. And a better range of motion was achieved when using a substituting, which is PCL sacrificing. Mm -hmm. Although I have to tell you, I have gone through those papers, that better range of motion is not a dramatic difference. But 5 to 10 degrees is also a very important difference. 5 degrees, if you consistently can give better flexion. By just five minutes in your group of patients. Next, please. The reasons for this change in trend were pathologies ranging from minimal to major contractures can be treated more predictably with PCL sacrificing. And as I told you earlier, the proponent disadvantages of having to reset the disadvantage of having to reset more intercondylar bone started reducing more by the reasons of the implant designs improving on it. And the advantages were more than uh, the disability. Next thing. So, I am now introducing a lateral subject. Why is this is about selection of implants? But an implant is nothing without understanding what the plastic insert of is all about. And as far as plastic insert is concerned, you need to understand the one thing that is important about plastic insert that they are not like metal, so they can fail, they are obviously softer materials compared to metals. So, the major long term failure in TK was the polythene wear at its sequin, once it starts failing, osteolysis, implant losing and instability, these three things, once the all poly starts, uh, your polyethylene starts failing, it will create osteolysis, implant loosening and instability. Next please. So how to reduce wear in fixed bearing knees? Hmm? Next please. So where are the wear part? Where can a wear happen? And here I will plug in the cobalt chrome and titanium hmm. that I mentioned earlier. So wear occurs <coughs> common sense that the, this plastic layer is subjected to movement on two aspects. The top side where the femoral condyle moves <coughs> here. Well, the female, this is common sense, it's obvious there is grinding going on here. And the bottom side, where micro movements are happening between this plastic and this tray. So that is known as backside wear. Charles Eng, again a, a, a very respected name in arthroplasty, again from the US, he uncovered, I don't even want to say the word discovered, but he uncovered the effect of backside wear and how it can be damaging and and I will come to it in a moment but why is it specifically different from top side wear mm. so top side wear is one type of wear in knees backside wear is another type of a problem Charles Eng showed that large osteolytic cavities he observed cavities are forming underneath the PBL tray in the tibial metaphysis. And at retrieval, the top side was not all that damaged. It's only when he saw the bottom side that he saw that there was wear going on of a very different nature as compared to the top side. In, in knees, unlike in hips, plastic fails in joints by two different mechanisms, the wear part of it. In the hip, it's a highly polished ball which is rubbing against the top. And this type of wear is known as abrasive wear, and it typically generates very fine particles. And that is why when hips were failing during Charlie times, etc., they initially thought it was a cement disease, 
that it was a cement which was causing all these osteolysis in the femur. It was only later realized that it was not a cement disease, it was this fine plastic wear of a particular micron sized particles which was stimulating a histiocytic immune response from the body. And while those immune cells, histiocytes were trying to engulf and destroy the plastic particles, they were releasing enzymes, kinins and all sorts of deadly stuff, which were eating up the patient's own bone rather than the plastic alone or plastic itself. You know? So, but in the knees, such weight is rarely seen. It's certainly nowhere near in the knees, bone destruction was happening due to mechanical reasons rather than histiocytic responses. Mm. Like in the body as you so. Why? Because the knee, in the knee, the gastric fails, and this is a good example of one retrieval, and I'm passing it around. Just look closely at the visual things that you can see here. In the knee, the plastic fails by what is known as the subsurface cracking. The stress points are the stress points. If, for example, this is your knee surface mm -hmm. and if there is a extra point here the breaking happens it's not the rubbing which destroys it it is this deformation just a few microns mm -hmm. underneath the surface that there is a crack so there is a crack here a crack there a crack there a crack there and then it and it then joins together and it comes off like a laminate mm -hmm. so in the knee revisions when you see you will find flakes of plastic coming out in a hip division, you will just see tissue, granulomatous tissue. You know, you will not usually see flakes of plastic coming out in a failed hip. But in a knee, with regularity, wherever the knee has failed due to plastic wear out, aseptic plastic wear out, you will see flakes of plastic, as you can see there. So, topside wear is where laminar subsurface breaking occurs, and it's known as uh, laminar uh, wear and failure. Backside wear is abrasive failure, which generates particles like it does in the hip. And that is where a uh, uh, lot of histiocytic reaction can happen if by chance your knee design, and so I'm correlating all this science with your ability to select an implant or evaluate an implant. If your knee design is modular in nature, which means your plastic can be fitted later, you know, as a separate pack instead of factory fitted, single mold molded, you know, monoblock component. Your locking mechanism, the way in which locking of that plastic happens with the TPA tray, has become a major aspect of the design evaluation of a knee implant. So many companies and I will leave it at this year at, on this point, we will talk about it in some other forum. Hmm? That how to, what are the different types of locking mechanisms which now exist in the market of how different companies allow their plastic to lock with that metal tray. The metal tray could be either titanium or copper. But gradually, titanium fell out of favor. Why was titanium introduced by Sinto? Titanium as a metal is far more uh, tensile, tensile coefficient of uh, yeah, tensile, uh, plastic bending is mimicking the human uh, uh, bony uh, flexural thing and it is much resist, more resistant to tensile things. So like for example in aircrafts etc. it's all titanium that is used. But titanium as a metal does not offer itself for high grade polishing. So titanium by definition will not be is you cannot uh, uh, polish it anywhere near what you can do to a cobalt probe. And when backside wear as a phenomenon got recognized and it started gaining momentum, the manufacturers and the engineers say that if you use titanium, we cannot polish it beyond this point. But cobalt chrome we can. And therefore, you started getting a having TBL trays wear as an option. A uh, cobalt chrome will offer you what is known as highly polished cobalt covered from trays and that is for those who are very keen to avoid any chance of a backside wear. So backside wear can be avoided or minimized by virtue of the nature of the metal you select, the locking mechanism and the plastic and that we will talk about in a moment. The nature of or the characteristics of the plastic itself, the, the insert itself. 
Next, please. So, the femoral component mm -hmm. at the top side where the femoral component has a tremendous impact on the top side where the geometry, the material, the design, the surface finish of the femur. Mm -hmm. The polytibial insert, surface finish, thickness, manufacturing and sterilization. So, in the plastic side of the story, there are factors which are to be taken into account. This will all become second nature to you once you discuss this, talk about it, you know, listen to these lectures again, and then all these factors. So, when, if, if, if for example, if I ask you a question, uh, let's discuss what are the factors which get involved, which are a part of the wear uh, phenomena and problem in means. So then very quickly you should first of all understand there is a top side and a back side. In the top side, what are uh, things that come into play? The femoral component in the top surface of the plastic and between the plastic. In the back side, where the TPL and the How can this femoral component have different aspects to it? Well, the geometry, the surface finish, the obviously therefore you never see a titanium femur. You will never see in your life a titanium femur, femur because a titanium femur uh, would be so rough that even in the early days of the manufacturing, they realize that you can't have a titanium femur, femur. it will just cut into the plastic and destroy it. Mm -hmm. you know? So, but the titanium tray, because initially they thought there is no movement, so there is no friction between the tray and the plastic. It's only later when Eng pointed out that something is happening, and then they went to the laboratories and they did their retrieval analysis and biomechanical studies, and they realized, oh, there are micro movements. And these micro movements even increase as plastic deformation takes place in, and therefore new locking methods were designed or incorporated into the TPL tray. And therefore it is said that if you take an insert out once, you should not put it back in again because the vast majority of inserts lock onto the TPL tray by virtue of plastic deformation. They, they are just designed in such a way that there is just a little bit more volume to that insert as compared to the tray. But when you press it, it sort of deforms itself and it locks itself into position. So once you take it out, you cannot then expect it to have the same type of a lock. You know? So um, just a quick recap that even though in backside wear, the, the wear is of the uh, the under surface of the poly due to micro movements that happen on the metal tibial plane, mm -hmm. but that leads to release of micro particles, particles which then end up uh, affecting the bone, the metaphysical bone underneath the tibial tray because of a histiocytic reaction. Yes. Yes. And it's not as if they percolate it down through the tray. No, they just uh, trigger the histiocytic They tray. actually, it can also lead even on the femur side also. I am just saying the history of backside started with Charles saying detecting those lighting ah, cavities in the tibial metaphysics. Okay. Okay. Later on, as people realize, they realize that there are instances. Thankfully, they were nowhere near as common as in the hip. Right. Because this is micro one, whereas in the hip, it is the primary okay. issue of the grindstone going on, you know, milling okay. going on in the hip right from the first moment. Okay. Yeah. Next, please. So, if, 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 if you see an osteolytic reaction on a post-op x-ray of a TKI, mm. then um, you would not suspect, if you have to choose between loosening in the femur side or the tibia side, you would, uh, uh, you would choose tibia side, in the sense you would choose poly, backside polywear as the culprit and not is, 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 is Very that interesting that? question. Uh, if you have, if I have to give you a classic example where the osteolytic the response that you would see in a femur in an otherwise aseptic, wow. well fixed, no, well fixed knee, well fixed. So there is hardly any other things, but you see an osteolytic reaction. Then I would suspect backside wear is the primary culprit. Once the knee becomes looser, then, then the, it, it, it's, it's a free fall of them. There are so many factors coming on. So, improve top side wear. So, how do you improve? So, uh, this is so much to this science, I can just keep on going. So, use of low contact femoral components. So, what am I saying? Very quickly, I need to uh, look at this. You will also see this as part of my answer to the question. 
uh, about uh, what is the difference between mobile bearing and food. So let, let me reserve it. Just remember what I am saying here. Low contact femoral components. Huh? Low contact femoral components. Well, anyway, what, let me just say. What, what do I mean by this? The, it's common sense. The higher the contact area between two surfaces, the more the friction. The less the surface area of contact, less the friction. So abrasive wear is directly related with that. But more the area of contact, less the pressure on one unit area. Point, point pressure. So in the history of evolution of the knees, people realize that so there was a flat, what is known as curved on flat design. Curved flat plastic tray, curved femoral implants. And why was that so? Because when they did a fully congruent design, curved on curved, hmm? curved tibia, sitting underneath the curved femur, congruent to each other. And like this, there was more stability. Curved on flat, there was medial lateral instability. Remember I told you Freeman later on regretted it. So there was mirror. So to prevent that video lateral and any other sort of sliding movement, they some designs came up with a full congruency. But those fully congruent designs, they were transmitting as the knee was going through these cycles, that that friction between these two was being transmitted onto the EPL component as sheer stress. Pushing back and forth, pushing, and they started loosening here underneath the bone. Besides the fact that there could be more abrasive wear in theory, mm -hmm. hmm? but independent of the abrasive wear, it was the sheer stress like this moving forward. So, so the pendulum swung from round on flat to curved on curve, and then here also they saw a problem. And now today you have the modern implant where you have semi curved. So they are curved, but not to the extent, Absolutely. and the control of medial lateral is through a spine and cam mechanism. And this has become more or less standard now. The semi congruency is known as semi congruency. Yes. So re to reduce the edge loading, high level power there, and the polytibial insert. Once again, as I said, we'll talk about the, there's an entire lecture on polytibial at some point. Next week, still. Oh, less, confirming. less confirming inserts, not a fully confirmation. So backside bearing, fixed bearing means question. Okay. Next week. Is backside bearing issue in fixed bearing? Uh, maybe I should just quickly go through this and we'll come back to this later. Mm -hmm. Because I think I'm going into too much detail for this particular so okay. Next week. Next. Just quickly. So here, the poly uh, insert, as you can see, the locking mechanism, all this. So backside wear represents 25% of the total volumetric wear that happens in a knee implant through its entire life cycle. 25%. Next week. So if you can reduce that, then itself becomes a major thing. Uh, okay, next. How to improve backside wear? Just quickly, I already mentioned all this. Improve the quality of the TBA plastic characteristic. We'll talk about it as a separate lecture. How to improve, what are the ways, what are the options. Improve the locking mechanism. The way in which a plastic insert locks on the tibial plate. Because these are the features in your deciding how to select an implant. Yeah. The reason for telling you all this, at the moment it is unfortunate, and I don't know whether I should mention this, uh, but I'm still going to do it, uh, because I think that's a fact of life. That vast majority of the surgeons, senior and junior both, are selecting their implants based on the ability to uh, acquire them at a price which they in turn can sell given all these various constraints of um, you know service prices that are being put by various forces of our country. Mm -hmm. Improve the modular tibia base. In other words, polish tray, etc. Mm -hmm. Polish tray, so that even if there is some micro movements, there will be less friction. So these are the ways. Uh, next week. Uh, improve the plastic uh, Characteristics, we'll talk about this as a separate lecture. Let's go ahead. I'm just giving you this that just by improving the plastic characteristic, how to improve, what are the options that we can do in a separate lecture. But look at this chart. It is reducing 
just by changing the characteristics of the plastic, everything else remaining the same. The wear is reduced by uh, a factor of 25%. Next, please. Oh, 40%. Because, sorry, sorry, my fault. Yeah. And then, just by improving the locking mechanism, next, please. The wear was next, was reduced by a factor of 85% reduction in micro motion, not the wear, but micro motion, just by reducing that. And that resulted in uh, maybe 30% reduction in wear. Next. Uh, well, there you go, 30% reduction in wear. Next, please. So, anyway, this is just to uh, tell you the features of one particular plate, but the important thing here is this from the PS Sigma stable uh, of implants. But the point that you need to take home is not whether it is a PSA sigma clay or not, it's the science of this. You know? Next please. Next please. Uh, uh, the, the polishing. Once you polish the tray, 54% reduction in tray surface leads to almost 50% reduction in wear. So all these things make a big difference. Next please. 85% uh, reduction in wear. So uh, uh, let, let's go through, we'll come back to this in a separate lecture. So now we come back to the main lecture again. I just wanted to bring in the science of poly or at least briefly so to make you guys understand how important is it to understand all this when you are selecting an implant. Mm -hmm. you know, the selection of an implant is not about my boss used to do this and that's how I know and that's why it's best. Or it's not about it, the cheapest implant available to me. It's about understanding why. You might eventually be influenced by the commercials of the issue, but it should be aware of the science first and then factor in the commercial. So, you had mobile bearing processes as now coming into play. And this was the first of this concept was brought in by a, a man called Fred Burkel, Frederick Burkel of America in, in, in partnership with a biomedical engineer called Papas. You know? So, Burkel Papas, it came to be known as a Burkel Papas, which was a uh, uh, which was a concept of mobile bearing. It was later on termed as LCS, low contact stress uh, posture cushion, by GPU uh, JNJ stable. But the, <coughs> the first of the implant was known as the Buka Papasu, which the company registered trademark is the LCS. It's one of the most successful implants implanted in the world. And as you can see, this is a cruciate retaining design. There is no bump here. You also had uh, a, a very early stage, although I have never used this, I have used these a few. The posterior cruciate uh, retaining but of a, almost a, of a very strange looking uh, So the anterior cruciate is obviously replaced because the tray is complete. But the plastic is uh, for some reason divided into two separate mobile uh, as if they, so because they were known as menisci, they say. Mm -hmm. Whether they were mm, two different minutes. Mm -hmm. Next please. So more than all that, I want you to understand now is your answer to your question. What is the difference between mobile bearing and fixed bearing? Fixed bearing, as the word shows, all those modular needs, they are fixed. They, once you put the plastic in, it is fixed. And we are now nearing the end of the talk, uh, lecture. Once you put the plastic in, it is fixed. That's why they are known as fixed bearing. Mobile bearing, as the name indicates, the bearing is mobile. This plastic is not fixed to the TPL plate. It actually moves. And there are slightly different ways in which it can move. For example, go back please. See, here, there is a central pad. So, there is this TPL insert with a central pad. So, when it moves, it will move like this. Okay? Here, they are separate from each other. So it is not necessary that it, when this moves, this has to move exactly the same degree in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mobile bearing also has got some nuances. Not all mobile bearings have a central peg, etc. But there are not too many variations. Because mobile bearing, why was mobile bearing brought into play? We will answer your question and that is what the next slide is about. So, Understand this. Only wear occurs because of fatigue wear, aggressive wear, abrasive wear. Let's not go into the details of how to define these three different types of wear, but just understand that poly wear 
is an important part of long term implant survival. And poly fails because of wear and wear are of this type. Just remember the major blocks. If you can do something which can reduce the wear, then that's a fantastic thing to have done. Who next? And that is where mobile bearing came into play. So before you focus on this slide, don't focus on this, listen to me. The other thing that was understood as time went by and retrieval studies were happening and laboratory studies were happening, that polyethylene as a material in the early, once you put in a pristine new material and then when the knee starts working, there is some creeping change in the creeping change in the plastic. There is a plastic deformation in the poly, and that you will see in any revision that you do. There will be some uh, raising up of the borders of the poly, etc. And once that plastic deformation reaches a stable state, and then if it is a unidirectional wear, just like this, then the poly is far more resistant to destruction. Unlike a multi-directional wear, which means instead of just this, it is like this. Mm -hmm. And the easiest thing I can tell you that why a multi-directional movement between two surfaces creates far more friction and therefore the ability to polarize things is if you have seen your grandmother doing the chutney in the stone mortar and castle. Mm -hmm. If you see uh, anyone doing the chutney, you know, your green chili chutney or red chili chutney, it will not be just like this. Because intuitively and instinctively their mind has processed. That when I do a multi-directional wear, the paste becomes much more finer and thinner and you know uh, amorphous in its nature, consistency. So that same thing holds true for the polyvein. So what was happening? So I'm blocking this so that your brain doesn't get occupied with this. Huh? To remember one, how a poly can fail in one way of failing is this multi-direction. Another is I showed you here that if you generate a point pressure, then it can fail. Third thing that for stability, huh, if you want to if you want to avoid point pressure, then what do you have to do? Increase the contact area between the two. But the moment you increase the contact area, it is a Mortar and pestle thing that large surfaces are rubbing against each other, and now those large surfaces, especially those large contact areas, if they also have a polydirectional, multidirectional movement, then the abrasive wear will go through the roof. So, is there a way where I can have large surface area so that I reduce the contact pressure points, you know, and yet? somehow turn the movement into a way in which there will only be a unidirectional uh, unidirectional movement. So Bukev and Pahas, they came up with this brilliant idea that how about if we do something what we will just see, which will give you a large surface contact area with congruency, which will reduce the point pressure, which is the way in which plastics fail in me. So once you reduce that, the subsurface cracking will reduce. And yet, because of that change they brought, they dissociated the moment on the top side, which is the major movement area, into a way in which on one side, on the top side only this occurs, on the bottom side only this occurs. You know? So here, how does a low contact design? So first, see if it is a point, see this is a plastic, this is the femur, and if you do not have this conforming to each other, then you are loading it at one point, and the pressures that are generated are so high that they go right down, what does it lead to? It leads to cracking, point cracking, mm -hmm. just under the surface it leads to point cracking, and as it goes, there's those cracks spray, and eventually it joins up and an entire lamina mm -hmm. is See. sort of break up. So this is what happens when you have non-consuming designs and all this is about a spectrum. So flat on round is the highest uh, pressure producing, round on round is the lowest, 
But I told you just a few minutes back that round on round had its own problems. Flat on round had its own problem. Round on flat. Uh, sorry, round on flat had its own problems. So most joints today of a fixed bearing nature have got a compromising issues. But Dukhya Papa said that I will continue with the advantages of round on round, but bring in a design change which will protect the poly in terms of its other wear. So that is next thing. So how did they do it? Bringing in the mobile bearing. So mobile bearing had an attempt to address the problem of fatigue polyware while addressing the complexity of the feature. Next please. So here, now this is a mobile bearing diagram. So see, there is a full conformity between the femoral contour and the tibial uh, insert contour. They, they are fully in contact with each other. But what happens? So what is the advantage? Especially because there is this term called the edge loading. What is edge loading? Whether if when you are on round or flat and while walking, the human body often has a tendency to do like this. That's why your mediolateral stability is very important. What is known as a lift off. Hmm? So that moment when a lift off occurs, the entire body weight turns on just one condyle, and then there is a very, very, if it is a point load, then the pressures go through the roof. But just imagine that a lift off occurs, which you cannot prevent. In theory, you cannot prevent it 100% of the time, no matter how well into inverted commas balanced your collaterals are. Because so many times it's the way in which a person has developed their gait. If they, if they, they have just developed a way in which they throw their body weight here and there when they walk. Hmm? So there will be times when there is a lift off. When the lift off occurs, if it is a complete congruency, then the pressure per unit area pressure is less. So what they did? When they brought full conformity, like this, they brought full conformity. But at the same time, they introduced mobility between the tibia tray <coughs> and the insert. And therefore, the multi-directional wear was eliminated. So the reason why plastics would wear very rapidly, that was reduced hugely. Next thing. So as you can see here, the, so the under surface is, is one direction, the top surface is completely other direction. And this particular mobility, although, and, and another major important thing, yes, why am I forgetting? It's not just about the wear of the plastic. Remember, I told you that conformity had another problem that it was transmitting shear stresses to the bone. implant bone interfacing. Here, at the moment the, the plastic rotates off, there is no further transmission down. All those shear stresses are dissipated at this time. Samjai, can you understand this? And if this moment, if this moment, because this is all combined as a single unit, the plastic and the tray, it is pushing the plastic and the tray forwards and backwards. But in theory, just imagine that I am doing this, but when plastic is moving between, there is movement between the plastic and the tray, it is not a single unit. Then all the forces, shear forces are dissipated at that level. They are not transmitted further down onto the bone, uh, bone implanted. Mm -hmm. So mobile bearing became a game changer. Mm -hmm. It allowed conformity without loosening of the implant and bone uh, bonding and also reduced the multidirectional wear. Mm -hmm. And that's why mobile bearing was a game changer. Why is it that despite that mobile bearing did not occupy the vast majority of this? Because as I told you, all this is parallel processes, it's not sequential. So in the meantime, people, manufacturing side, material engineers, they came up with the understanding, oh, well then, if we do this to the plastic, if we cross-linking, if we increase the cross-linking, if we add antioxidants, then they become, the plastic becomes so resistant to abrasive wear. So then, then this <laughs> so it's a, a combination of so many different factors. Next please. So many different designs in the market. Next please. And now this is the last two slides. Ceramic. I, we won't go into the details of ceramic. Uh, in India, we have just uh, had a, a launch of the all ceramic name uh, in the south by plus of three weeks. Uh, ceramic is all more about material characteristics, how they are less prone to wear, just like 
ceramic and ceramic in the hips. Right? Uh, but still, so uh, embryonic in its stage that I won't occupy it for today. Next, please. Next. Next. So the one thing that I will go back one. So, whilst all ceramic, true ceramic knees are uh, still very, very uh, early in their evolution and in their commercialization, ceramic as defined by Smith and Nebula. They have brought in a knee which their standard femoral components, just the regular range of their components. They cover it with a material called poxine, which they say as it's a ceramicized metal coating. So it has the characteristics of ceramic in terms of its highly polished and therefore reduced weight. And we'll talk about it as a separate subject. Next week. Next week. So and then you have the all quality tibia, and I won't go into this, you just said this is a separate lecture in itself. The merits of the all quality tibia, but this is one of the best lectures that you will ever hear, and we'll do it as a separate thing. Next, please. Next, then let's go through the end. Ah, and now stop it. Medial fever pain. And the last, that is now once again just about in India, at least it's making, a, uh, uh, ma making interesting uh, discussions. Is that the medial pivot knee, which is a knee design in itself, which is completely different from the all that you heard up to now. And we'll talk about the medial pivot knee as a design rational later. So, next, please. Next, 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 next. 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 We'll take it up and okay. again, go, go, go through, go right up to the end of the lecture. Okay, good. So, what I just to synopsize, what have you learned today? This was a long version of it. Uh, what you have done today is sort of uh, taking off from the ski slope, slope of uh, the history of knee implants. You understood how we arrived at the major blocks of implants that you have commercially available. Fixed bearing, and we are talking about only about uh, total implants, so our unique audience. So you have the fixed bearing. Cruciate retaining and cruciate sacrificing. You could have the mobile bearing, which you understood why mobile bearing has some merits to it. You heard that there are something called material based distinct implants like the ceramics. And then you lastly saw the slide of the medial pivot. During that, the vast majority, the chances are that for the next 10 years of your careers, you are only going to use the fixed bearing. Either crucial sacrificing or crucial retaining depends upon which religion you eventually gravitate down to. In either case, going into the finer aspects of implant selection, once you have decided that okay, I'm going to use a crucial sacrificing as the workhorse of my practice, then you need to understand that when you select your implant, there are so many finer aspects like the quality of the plastic, the grade of the plastic, the locking mechanism, and the the the, the J curve. We'll talk about that again. What is the meaning of a single radius femoral component design as compared to a multi radius, which is the J curve? So these are again going into the details of it. Most of that I hope you guys will retain is that implant selection is a massive science. It takes you down so many interesting gullies and pathways, and if you go down these pathways and explore them again and again at the cerebral level, your decision will be rational, even if there are certain other factors like availability of an implant or the commercials of an implant, etc. But at least you will be aware of the aspects in total. And then it is up to you to keep on going to as much depth as you want on a particular aspect of your knee implant selection protocols. Okay. Thank you for your. Thank you.